Hi everybody, in this week's episode of Gaffer and Gear, we're gonna be having a look at this little RGB WW tube light. Now, I'm gonna be buying four of these because I reckon this is a really versatile, handy little thing to have in my kit. And here's why. Okay, built-in battery, so no cables. Well, that's pretty standard these days on small lights. But this thing has a magnetic back, quarter inch screw threads either sides. So it's very, very easy to mount. Now to give you some idea of the versatility of this unit, here are a couple of quick shots I took with my phone in the kitchen. So in this shot here where my fiance is pretending to look at a notice, this is literally just stuck on the front of the fridge like that. If you're working in somewhere small like an oven, the magnets come in super handy for mounting. Now here's why I'd recommend buying this light if you're a gaffer. It's very hard to justify owning specialty lights because we don't use them all that often. But this thing comes in at only 99 US bucks. All right, so let's have a look at what you get for your 99 bucks. So you get the light, which is the Nanlite Pavo Tube 2 6C. Now the 6C I think refers to the fact that it's six watts maximum power draw and it's color. Uh, you get a uh, carry strap that screws into either end. And the next bit's genius. You get three pieces of metal. Okay, so these three little pieces of metal. So. What's the story with the pieces of metal? Well, the back of the light is magnetic. So the idea is, if you want to mount this to something that's not metal, you basically tape the pieces of metal to the surface and then mount the light to the metal. How genius is that? And you also get a bag to put everything into. So let's start off the review by talking about improvements in the design between this and the original design tubes that came out about two and a half years ago. So the biggest pain in the ass for me with these tubes was the on off switch. So what would happen uh, more often than not, and I do own 16 of these tubes, is I would charge up the tubes uh, the day before so they're ready to go, put them in their bags, put them in the back of the van, and sure enough, with at least one of the tubes, the on-off switch would get knocked and the light would turn on. So by the next morning when I'm on set, the battery's completely flat. So that would happen more often than I'd care to remember. Now that can't happen with the new light. If something does tap your button in transport, the light's not gonna turn on. Now even if something presses against the on-off switch, it won't turn the light on. So it's gonna try once, and it'll try a second time, and then the light will just shut off. You're not gonna flatten your battery. So if you wanna turn this on, you actually have to hold the button down until the NAN light logo comes up, then release, and then bang, your light's gonna turn on. So I think that is absolute genius. Now the next improvement for me are the buttons and the menu system. So one thing I like is the buttons are recessed. So if somebody rented this off me and they were looking to mount this to a wall and they were sticking something on the back, they're not gonna rip the buttons out. Now the next thing uh, that I didn't like with these was the amount of buttons and knobs. You've got six buttons and two knobs to operate it. Whereas uh, they've really simplified the menu system here, you've just got five buttons. And by far the biggest improvement to this light is the even distribution of the LEDs over the front diffuser. Now one thing I do like about this tube light compared to other brands is these guys didn't make it a perfect cylinder. They actually have some flat points on the back. So this is really handy. You can put it on a table and it's not gonna roll away anywhere. So you can have it on a 45 degree angle 90 degree angle or a 45 degree angle the other way. Furthermore, if you're trying to mount this to a wall, you've got a large surface area because it's flat. Now, if you want to get this on a more precise angle, Nanlite do sell a lot of accessories. So you could buy uh, one of these tube holders, for example, and just lock it onto the angle that you want. Now, it's worth noting that Nanlite do make a lot of really good quality T12 tube accessories. So it might be worth having a look through their catalog to buy stuff for your existing tube product. Now, the unit has a built-in battery that can run the light at full power for one hour and 10 minutes. But if you wanna extend that battery life, you can simply use a USB battery pack. But here's the catch. If you buy a cheap USB battery pack, that'll only output typically one amp, which will give you five watts, and the light at full power draws six watts. Now, if you get a decent battery pack that uh, outputs, say, 2.4 amps, like this thing can, not only can you run the light at full power, but you can also simultaneously charge the battery. Now, running this thing off external power to extend the battery life does come at a cost. 
Unfortunately, they put the USB port on the back. So what's the problem with that? Well, if we want to put this on the table lighting upwards, we can't do that. If you want to mount it to a wall, well, now the cable's in the way. All right, so let's get into a run through and show you what this thing can do. Now let's quickly go over the display. In the top left hand corner is the current mode that you're running in. The top right hand corner has your battery remain time. Now this runtime is quite conservative. If you turn the light on with a fully charged battery at 100% brightness, it'll tell you that you've got 0.9 of an hour. Now, in reality, you've got one hour and 10 minutes. Now, it does seem to go down linear with real time, except it sits at 0.1 of an hour for a very, very long duration. Okay, so there's five buttons on the back. One of those five buttons is the power button. So there's only actually four buttons to operate the menu system. Uh, the first button up in the top corner is your mode selector button. So that changes the mode you're operating in. So we've only got uh, four modes. So we've got our CCT mode, which is our white light mode. I'll just get some uh, uh, lights off in here. The next mode, if you press, is your HSI mode, which is basically your RGB color mode. The next mode is effects. And um, this is an effect I just put in. This is candle. Um, look at the roll off that the, um, the LED drivers have. It's a smooth roll off. That, that looks you know, convincingly like it could be a candle. And then the next thing in the, uh, in the mode selector button is, um, is basically your channel selector. So you know, what channel that you're using for your phone app or the remote control. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Now let's talk about the remaining three buttons that drive the menu system. You've got plus and minus, that's pretty straightforward. And you've got your switch button. The switch button changes the parameter that you can adjust with your plus minus. So for example, in the CCT mode here, the dimmer is selected. But if I press the switch button, we now have the CCT selected. And if I press the switch button again, we can now adjust plus minus green. Now let's have a look at the CCT mode. In the CCT mode, you have three parameters of adjustment, dimming, Kelvin, and plus minus green. Now this thing will dim from 100% down to 0% in 1% increments. In terms of your CCT range, you have a whopping 2,700 Kelvin at the bottom, all the way up to 7,500 Kelvin. Now that sounds great, but here is the catch with this. Um, the unit basically tracks as a bicolor, so it uses its cool emitter and its uh, warm emitter to adjust the Kelvin, and that is a linear track. Now, because it's got such a large extent of CCT from 2,700 to 7,500 Kelvin, it goes well under the Planckian curve. Which brings me to the next uh, mode of adjustment, which is plus minus green. Now, if this light didn't have a plus minus green mode, I would not buy this light and it wouldn't be good enough to get reviewed. So with the light set to a zero plus minus green value, it is ridiculously pink. As you can see in the photo here, one side of my face is lit with the light set to 5,600 Kelvin with zero plus minus green. The other side of my face is lit with ambient daylight. Now you don't need a color meter to see that one side of my face is clearly pink. In fact, this light is the furthest from the Planckian curve of any light I have ever reviewed. Now it's saving grace isn't just the fact that it's got a plus minus green mode, but that plus minus green mode interacts perfectly with the white color emitters. So what I mean by that is if you select a Kelvin with the white color emitters and then select your plus minus green, if you dim the light, it retains its ratios. So let's just check this out now. So this has got a plus uh, 12 green on it. Let's check that it's retaining its ratios as we dim. Now for me, I'll be running this thing between plus 12 and plus 15 green all the time. And the reason I'm gonna have a bit of variation in there is not all of my other lights have a perfect white point either. But I found that if you put this at about plus 12 green, it matches in with other bicolor lights. It basically brings the white point up to where other good bicolor lights sit. Now let's have a look at the unit's HSI mode. And it does have a full HSI mode, which is quite unusual at this price point. So let's have a look. It has all 360 colors. And not only that, it desaturates to its white color emitters, not some RGB mix crap. And it desaturates in 1% increments, giving you the full 36,000 colors that you'd expect from a HSI mode. Okay, now next up is the effects menu. And some of the effects are okay, like welder. 
If you've got a club scene and you've got a few of the lights, the disco mode's not too shabby. Now the one effect that is surprisingly good is the candle fire mode, particularly if you get a couple of them working together. Now you can select the bottom and the top of the flicker range, you can select the speed at which it flickers, and you can select the Kelvin. Now the last thing you can select with the mode button is the menu, and the menu basically allows you to select your uh, channel for running it off uh, phone app or, or via remote. You can also select your language and check the firmware version because the light is firmware updatable. Now in terms of running it off a phone app, uh, you can't run it directly between the uh, phone app and the light. You need one of these base stations. Now, this base station costs 300 US dollars. And in all honesty, I can't recommend buying this because the, um, the app is uh, very out of date. So for example, this light can, uh, has a Kelvin range up to 7,500 Kelvin. The app hasn't caught up to this. The app only goes up to 5,600 Kelvin. Now, if you dial in 5,600 Kelvin on the app, you get 7,500 Kelvin on the light. The other problem is they still haven't fixed the glitches in the Android software. It still crashes on occasion when you go to save it. Now, while I can't look you in the eye and recommend getting the base station, for 40 Australian dollars, you can buy the remote control. And look, the remote control is not fully compatible with the light. It wasn't designed to run the light, uh, but it can run your dimmer and you can select your CCT. Okay, so basically it runs those as two channels. Now, when you dial in uh, 6,500 Kelvin on the remote, which is as high as the remote goes, that's 7,500 Kelvin on the light. So you're gonna have to do a little bit of figuring out to get your Kelvin, but for 40 Australian dollars, I can recommend this for the, the ease and convenience it's gonna give you on the set. Okay, that's the run through done. Now let's get into the technical data. And all of this data is data that I collect myself here in the workshop using spectrometers. Okay, first off, let's start off with lux. And because these are small fixtures, I've measured lux at a distance of one meter. At 3,200 Kelvin, you get 125 lux. At 4,400 Kelvin, you get 130 lux. And at 5,600 Kelvin, we get 133 lux. Now, CCT accuracies, how accurately it dials in the Kelvin that you put on the back. Now, on average in the warm whites, that's anywhere between 2,700 to 4,000 Kelvin. In the warm whites, it's typically accurate to minus 60 Kelvin. In the mid whites, that's 4,000 to 5,000 Kelvin, it's typically accurate to minus 84 Kelvin. And in the cool whites, 5,000 to 6,000 Kelvin, it is typically out by on average minus 121 Kelvin. Now let's have a look at the average TLCI scores. Now between 2,700 to 4,000 Kelvin, it averages 97.6. In the mid whites, 4,000 to 5,000 Kelvin, it averages 98.4. And in the cool whites, 5,000 to 6,000 Kelvin, it averages 99. Now let's have a look at TM30 color vector testing. In the warm whites, it's averaging 93. In the mid whites, it's averaging 92.8. And in the cool whites, it's averaging 92.3. All right, let's take a closer look at our more commonly used Kelvins. When I dialed in 3,200 Kelvin, I got 3,174 with a TLCI score of 98. The average CRI score was 93.5 with R6, R10 and R12 all below 90. TM30 color vector testing revealed a more accurate score would be 93% color render with 102% saturation. Note that there are some rather unusual variations in the graphic. This is the color spectrum and all looks good. And color mapping reveals that the white point is off the Planckian curve by a staggering minus 0.0082 DUV, which would be a gels equivalent of roughly a one quarter and a one eighth plus green combined. When I dialed in 4,400 Kelvin, I got 4,321 Kelvin with a TLCI score of 98. The average CRI score was 92.4, but the individual results are a very mixed bag. TM30 color vector testing reveals a more accurate score would be 93% color render with 103% saturation. And note on the graphic, there are some skewings and under and over saturations. This is the wavelength analysis and it looks pretty reasonable. And color mapping reveals that the white point is off by a staggering 0.0089 DUV, which in old terms would be more than a one quarter plus a one eighth gel combined. 
when I dialed in 5,600 Kelvin, I got 5,475 Kelvin with a TLCI score of 99. However, the CRI score was much lower at 93.2 and the individual scores are very mixed. TN30 color vector testing suggests a more accurate score would be 93% color render with 103% saturation. And the white point is off the Planckian curve by a staggering 0.0082 DUV, which in old terms is about the equivalent of a 1 quarter plus a 1 eighth gel combined. Now let's have a look at the light's hue and saturation accuracies, starting with the primary colors at 100% saturation. Red, which should be zero, came in at one degree. Green, which should be 120 degrees, came in smack on at 120. And blue, which should be 240, was smack on at 240 degrees. Now let's take a look at our secondary colors at 100% saturation. Yellow, which should be 60 degrees, came in surprisingly accurate at 65. Cyan, which should be 180 degrees, came off at 224 degrees. And magenta, which should be 300 degrees, came in at 258 degrees. Now let's look at the results with the saturation down at 50%. And it's worth noting that at full desaturation, the lights desaturate to 6,155 Kelvin. So I took my measurements at the D65 standard and I was surprised at how accurate it was. Red, which should be zero degrees, came in at zero degrees and 47% saturation. Green, which should be 120 degrees, came in at 117 degrees with a surprisingly accurate 51% saturation. Blue, which should be 240 degrees, came in at 245 degrees with 81% saturation. And yellow, which should be 60 degrees, came in at 63 degrees with 49% saturation. Cyan, which should be 180, came in at 218 degrees at 56% saturation. And magenta, which should be 300 degrees, came in at 267 degrees at 65% saturation. So overall, very surprising accuracy with the HSI, especially for a $99 light. I'm Andrew Locke. Don't forget to click like and subscribe, and I'll see you on set.